Hey guys, welcome to another exciting episode of Submission Radio. I'm Dennis Skradov. I'm here with Kasper Rosalowski. It's April 24th and we've got a huge show for you. It's going to be a big one. We've got TJ Dillashaw in the building. Well, actually, he's not in the building. He's in Sacramento, California, but he's going to be live on the show. We're going to be chatting to him about his title fight at UFC 173 against Hannon Burrell, uh, Uriah Faber. We've got some fan questions. Some of the guys on the forums, we've got their questions. We're going to ask those in the interview as well. Uh, I've got some other big things on the show. Dennis, tell, tell the viewers at home what they've got in store. Well, thank you. And you know what? They might have buildings in Sacramento too, but you know they're not as good as the sexy buildings that we're in. Um, we will be breaking down the UFC 172 card. We'll be talking about predictions, and we will be analyzing what happened over the weekend at the Verdun Brown fight card. Obviously, a lot of stuff coming out of that. You'll get our opinions later on in the show after the interview. That's correct. As always, guys, you can follow us on Twitter at Submission Oz. That's Submission A U S. Check out our brand new YouTube channel. It's not the old one. It's uh, Submission Radio A U. Check out the Facebook Submission Radio A S. And as always, this is available on Stitcher, iTunes, TuneIn, and pretty much anything that has a reception. So give that a download. Give that a click. Um, I think without further ado, it's TJ Dillashaw time. That's it, guys. And don't forget, if you have any questions, anything that you want to say, comment section below. You know, we look at the comment section after the, after the episodes, so we'll be happy to answer any questions or take in any advice, feedback, or questions for future episodes. Yeah, what do you guys think of Travis Brown and Verdum? Or what do you think what's going to happen at UFC 172? We want to know. But, um, yeah, I think it's time for TJ Delisha. Let's do it. All right, guys, our next guest has been known as the Viper. No, we're not talking about Randy Orton. This man is challenging Henan Burrell at UFC 173 for the world bantamweight title of the world. He is the man of the hour. He is none other than TJ Dillashaw. TJ, welcome to the show. Uh, God, thank you. Appreciate it. It's an absolute pleasure having you on the show today, TJ. Um, we want to ask you a few questions about your title fight, but first off, we'll go back a little bit in time. Uh, going back in time to when you were a finalist on the Ultimate Fighter, Bisping versus Miller, which uh, this was only a couple of years ago in 2011. It's now 2014, and you're in a title fight for the bantamweight title against Hannah Burrell. What goes through your head when you think about this kind of transformation? Uh, it's just kind of crazy how fast this all happened, you know? Um... Obviously, I had the utmost belief in myself and uh, believed I could get here, and it was only a matter of time to do it. But you know, I didn't, I didn't expect it to be this fast, and for me to make the gains that I've made. And uh, you know, I'm still pretty new to the sport, and I've uh, made leaps and bounds, and just uh, you know, put everything together, and it's, it's awesome. Now, TJ, you know, it's one thing um, hoping for something to happen, you know, envisioning something happening, and then it happens. Um, has it sunk in? that you'll be fighting for the title at UFC 173. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's something that we, we do big time with our team is uh, just the belief and visualizing uh, where you're going to be in the future and what your goals are and writing them on the wall and uh, trying to achieve them. And so, you know, I've watched my teammates go, th go through the same situations. And so, you know, I, I figured – I knew that I was going to get here. I just, like I said, didn't expect it to be this quick. So, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely am – Realize I'm here for the title. I'm feeling the pressure, and uh, I'm enjoying it. Now, in your Ryan Faber's camp in the lead up to UFC 169, you had to imitate Burrell for for your for your Raya. How good of a job do you feel that you did yeah. getting to know his style and imitating him? And uh, what were some of the subtle things that you learned about him throughout this process? Oh, you know, I feel like I've done a very good job of figuring out the way he fights. Um, you know, more so when I fought the first time than this last time. This last. This last fight, you're right, took the fight on a three week notice. So, you know, he's he's a gamer. He's never going to turn down a fight. He took it on short notice. So we didn't have as much time to prepare for this one. But uh, for the first time they fought, you know, I, like I said, I had to reenact him and Burrell, watch tape on him, and uh, and just, uh, you know, figure out what, what he likes to do. Um, I just feel like he's a, a dangerous guy. He's well rounded. You know, can take the fight anywhere. Um, just got to get him on his heels. Did you learn anything from the last fight that he had with the UI Faber? Obviously, there was a questionable stoppage there. But for the little while that it went for, did, did anything click in your head in terms of something that you do different um, from Uri in that fight? Oh, yeah. I just feel like he kind of stand, stood in front of him too long. You know, he's a, he's a dangerous striker, hits hard. And uh, it was just one of those things where he stood in front of him just a little bit too long and uh, was in his range and not in his own. You know, I mean, you got to be in your, your comfortable spot instead of where uh, Hinnabrow is comfortable. Now, uh, 
Obviously, there was a lot of controversy in regards to the finish um, of the Uriah Barrow fight. Um, and there's there's been some questionable refing decisions since, especially the most recent Brazil card. Is part of your relief that this fight is not only going to be at the historical MGM Grand, but also not in Brazil, which is known for some you know dodgy and dicey decisions and calls? Uh, absolutely. You know, I mean, not only just because of the decision. I mean, that was my fault ultimately for keeping the fight so close. Um, I do feel like I got robbed in that fight, but... Uh, you know, I, I should be I should be dominating more than that, anyways. But uh, I am stoked that it's in the states, well, not only for the decision factors, but just for the fact that I don't have to travel all across the world to do this fight. You know, it's only an hour and twenty minute flight for me. I'm used to the time zone. Um, you know, everything's gonna work out perfectly for me. Now, TJ, I just want to read you a little quote from Dana White from um, his media scrum. Um, so, just uh, I'm just gonna read it out now. Um, he says okay. he says. Literally, I've heard nothing from Dominic Cruz. I don't know what's going on with him. I don't think after this much of a laugh, it would be right to throw him in there for a title shot unless he wants it. He was the champ before all this stuff happened to him. And if he wanted to come right back and fight Brow, then yeah, I'd do it. But Brow's one of those guys, man. I think Brow's is so nasty. I'd fight someone else if it was me personally. Now, you've got this fight coming out with Brow for the title. Does it uh, play in your mind a little bit that some people are overlooking you a little bit, not really thinking about that you might be walking away with a title after UFC 173. No, I mean, um, you know, I mean, it is what it is. I mean, Brown's been on a, what, a nine year win streak, you know, um, 30 something fights in a row. So, I mean, obviously people are going to overlook me, especially because he's a champ already, you know. Um, it doesn't bother me. Uh, it actually, it's the first time I'm going to a fight as an underdog, so it's kind of like a, a stress reliever. I don't go in with these expectations of how good I'm supposed to do, um, and I actually get to prove everyone wrong. So um, I wouldn't say it's bothering me too much, and uh, yeah, I don't look into it. You know, I just try to stick to my game plan and what I'm good at. Assuming, uh, assuming everything goes to plan, you walk out with your hand raised. Uh, would you give Dominic Cruz a, a title shot upon his return straight away? Absolutely. I mean, if that's what he wants, you know. I mean. He was a champion when I was in, in when I first started out in this weight class, and that's who I was shooting for when I first uh, got into the game. Um, you know, but that's completely how he's feeling, how healthy he is. I mean, I really feel you know, bad for the guy what he's had to go through. Um, what about what about Uriah Faber? Now, obviously, obviously, uh, you know, Uriah is obviously winning fights, and if you come out victorious, there's a good chance Uriah is going to stay in number one contendership. Um, would you guys be able to put friendship aside and you know verse each other for the title? I don't see that happening. I don't see us ever having to fight each other. Um, you know, we're we're family. We're best buds. I've grown up in the sport behind him, and. Uh, you know, I, I feel that uh, unless they were going to pay us some uh, insane amount of money, then then no, I don't see us fighting. You know, but if they were to uh, to make it worth our while, I'd imagine we would. But you know, it's it's a business, and uh, we'll have to figure that time out when it comes. Just speaking on Uriah Faber, you know, um, tell us a little bit about your relationship with Uriah. How did you guys first meet, and um, what what's some of the stuff that Uriah has done for you throughout your career so far? Uh, we first met when he was trying to recruit me to wrestle at UC Davis. He was a coach at Davis when I graduated from high school. Um, they were trying to recruit me to wrestle there. And, uh, you know, um, I turned him down and went down to Cal State Fullerton and wrestled out my time there. But as soon as I got done wrestling, um, he recruited me once again to come and start training with Team Alpha Male. Um, he knew that I was somewhat interested in the sport and uh, said that he had the perfect camp for me and that I should come up and start training. And, uh, you know, the rest is history. He's kind of... He's guided my career. He's, you know, shown me not only how to um, how to, um, to live my my life inside of fighting, but also outside of it. You know, um, things to do to be successful, and uh, you know, I got to learn through his successes and mistakes. So now I almost got a shortcut shortcut to what I want to be. Now, all of you guys at Team Alpha Male, not only not only the guys there are all elite, but it seems like you guys all really you gel really well. What's the one thing at Team Alpha Male that helps you guys stay strong as a team and together and they won't find any other team in the world? Um, I think we're all very like-minded people. We were all attracted to what Uriah was creating. You know, we're all with a wrestling background and uh, and we're all very hard workers, you know. And um, he wanted to, when he first started this team, he was thinking he needed to get some training partners. So he started recruiting people and just uh, asking people to come and train. And the ones that stuck around and kept coming back, 
were the ones who were very like-minded as he was, you know. And uh, so we built this team that everyone thinks alike and likes doing the same things. And you know, pretty much just a big family. Now, talking about having an amazing team, you know, it's been documented very well over the last few weeks and months that Dane Ludwig is going to be leaving after your title fight. Um, you know, a lot of questions have been asked about this, so you must be getting pretty sick and tired of answering it. But just from a different perspective, can you tell us what's it like having Dwayne as a coach? We can go. And what's so special about him? What has he done for the team over the time that he's been there? You know, just like you said, we've had a world-class team since since I've been at the gym. Um, top of the world fighters, you know. Uh, Dwayne just kind of come in and structured the practices, turned it into almost like our, our college days into a wrestling practice, you know, a lot of, a lot of drilling and, and he came in with this respect that we all held for him that, you know, held us accountable for showing, showing up and doing the right things. And, and um, he's just a technical genius too, when it comes to his, his kickboxing. So when you add those little things to a uh, world-class team as it is, you're going to get results. Now, originally when Dwayne spoke to Sherdog in February, uh, he was asked about you versus Barrow in the future, and he said that he likes the matchup between you and Barrow, but ideally he'd like to see it at the start of next year. Prior to that, he'd like to see you face more adversity in the cage, because up until then you were just running through people. Uh, obviously the matchup has come up a lot sooner, and you and the team have had to adapt. What was the first piece of advice that Dwayne gave you when the matchup was announced? Um... You know, Dre is actually pretty stoked because he's planning on leaving and starting his own gym in, in Colorado, so it would be a perfect time for him to get a belt before he, uh, he vacates his coaching position here. So, um, and he's pretty stoked about it, but uh, we've already been training for Burrell, you know, since he's been here. Who is the champion in my weight class we've been training for? And we've been working for things for when I do get in that situation for that title fight. So he just, we already knew what we've been working on. It wasn't like he... Uh, I didn't think specific to say. It was like, all right, now everything we've been working towards it. So it's time to put into action. When we had Uri Faber on the show, we kind of joked around about us supplying to be a striking coach as a team alpha male. But, you know, um, there's been rumors that you guys have had a few people come by and do a couple of trial classes and really kind of see if they gel with you guys. Um, is it true that you had someone come by this week? And can you tell us about anyone who's been by as a new potential coach? We have not yet had anybody come by and uh, run any practices or do anything like that yet. I mean, that is our plan to see uh, who we can have come out and see how we vibe with them and see how their technique is and whatnot. But, no, we haven't had anybody yet. All right, excellent. Me and Dennis will send in our applications post-haste. We're getting on the plane right Perfect. after this. <laughs> um, hey, leading up to this fight against Hennon, uh, as far as your training camp goes, um, have you, uh, well, is the plan to work on new things in training or is it more of a camp where you just hone your previous skills and just try and polish those, those previous skills? Um, you know, what, what I got to do is not look into, you know, too much of what he's good at, obviously be aware of it and just, and focus on my game and what I'm already good at and, and make it better and just, uh, stick to my game plan and, and fight the way I fight. Now, uh, on the upcoming UFC 172 card, you have, you know, some big names from Team Alpha Male on the card. you got Danny Castillo and you have uh, Joseph Benavides. Um, what's going on in the gym? What's the vibe like leading into their fight? Um, how are the guys doing? Obviously, Danny's pretty low on the prelim fight pass cards. Joseph's the main event on the on the prelims. What's, what's the vibe like in the gym? That's been awesome, you know, especially because I have a, a title fight camp coming up. Uh, going on right now as well and it, it helped out to have those guys training for their fight this weekend you know to add it to the room being as tough as it is uh, we also have Andre Feely fighting on the main card as well he's part of our team uh, he's fighting Max Holloway so it's an exciting weekend for us and I expect all those guys to dominate they've been looking awesome in the room and uh, time to shine and so, sorry to cut in there Cass but just with Andre Feely you know and he's got um probably one of the better nicknames in MMA touchy feely but um can you tell us a little bit about what it's like having him on 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 your team obviously you know he came in he's had an interesting story can you tell us a little bit about what it's like training with him what it was like getting him to come past the team and become a pe part of t uh, team alpha male yeah absolutely Andre's a fun guy I would bring some uh diversity to the team you know we got a bunch of clean cut looking dudes and uh Andre comes in he's a little bit different look and super funny uh you know, and he, he's dedicated. He, he's kind of changed his lifestyle up since he moved in with the team. He was, you know, a fan of the sport and just kind of didn't have the right structure to where he was training at before. And uh, 
he fought one of our guys. That I think it's his only loss now. Um, it ended up beating him for a title fight in one of the smaller leagues, and he realized that we had something special going on, so he had to make the move and start to tell him to train with us. And uh, it, we changed his life. He's, he's a better person, not only just in, in the cage, but outside of it as well, and it, it's helped him out tremendously. Now, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned about a different look. We're going to go back in time a little bit. Uh, in 2006, you traveled to uh, Ukraine to work on your wrestling skills, something that I'm not, I'm not aware that a lot of Americans do. Now, funny enough, uh, Dennis is Ukrainian. Uh, and I'm Pol- Hello, I'm Dennis. And, uh, and I'm Polish, so we're both from the Eastern Bloc. Tell us about the experience. Okay. Uh, and what were some of the biggest differences between training in the U.S. as opposed to training uh, you know, in the Ukraine? It was an awesome experience. You know, I was a sophomore in college on a full ride scholarship to Cal State Fullerton. Um, it was over the summer, and I wanted to continue to get better. You know, we don't really have too many, too many summer leagues that are, that are that great out here. So I went out over to the Ukraine, like you guys said, um, where I'm wrestling against you know 17, 16 year old kids that are that are as strong as men. You know, they're just uh, they're awesome over there. I mean, they, they train wrestling freestyle. Some of them wrestle freestyle in Greco, which is a completely different style than I used to wrestling in college, you know, collegiate stuff. But uh, it still it still translates over. But, uh, you know, they're wrestling from a very young age, and that's all they're doing. They're living at the Olympic Training Center wrestling every day. You know, they don't have a job. They don't go to school. That's what they do. They wrestle. You know, that's what their life is made to be. And so I feel like they have a huge advantage when it comes to um, – Olympic style wrestling because they're so involved in it and uh, just learn how they live their lifestyle and the, the grind is there on every day. It, it, was, it was pretty cool to see. Yeah, now TJ, speaking of uh, other training experiences, you know, like mentioned before, you were a part of Team Bisbing and Bisbing versus Miller. Um, I guess this is sort of a two part. Or um, are you still in touch with Michael? Do you guys still chat sometimes? And did you watch his performance against Tim Kennedy, where um, he lost? And a lot of people are talking about his eye injury kind of stopping him from being the same fighter he was before. What are your thoughts on that, and do you think that's the truth? I haven't uh, stayed in touch with Bisping too much, no. Um, since the show, I mean, we, we, we chat here and there, and we see each other in person, but, you know, we both got busy lifestyles going on. We haven't really stayed in touch at all. Um, I, didn't, I did not watch his fight against Tim Kennedy. Um, I was filming the Countdown show then, so uh, I missed it. And, uh, yeah, I read, read up about it and stuff, but um, – I don't know. I'd have to watch the fight to uh, see if his eye is affecting him at all. Well, that throws the whole interview out of the loop. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? That just throws the whole interview astray. No, I'm kidding. We had 60 questions in regards oh. to that fight. No, no, we were just kidding. <laughs> I'm ripping up all the questions then. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I guess a big part of that win for Tim Kennedy was the strategy he used. So I guess, um, you know, fast forward to your fight against Hen and Burrell. What, do you, what are your biggest keys to victory at 173? And what do you do better than Burrell? I don't want to give away too much, but uh, just putting everything together at the right times. Um, you know, how well-rounded I can be and uh, just a better athlete. Um, you know, uh, just pressure and gr- get that wrestler grind, just the mentality of wearing them out. You know, I feel like my cardio will be better and I, and I want it more. And with Brennan, you know, Hannon, you know, a lot of people are putting him in the contention of, one of the best fighters, pan for pan. You know, you've mentioned he's been champion for a really long time. What are your thoughts on him as, as a fighter, as a competitor, as you know, as as a personality in the octagon? Obviously, he's got his fighting. He's got some personality. What are your thoughts on him? Well, not too much. Just he's a great fighter. You know, he's uh, been around the game for a long time. Um, I have no personal thoughts on him. I haven't, you know, really met the guy. He seems like all smiles. So uh, you can think about it. Um, so I don't know. I haven't really got to meet him personally, but he seems like he's always having a good time. He's got a smile on his face, but uh, he could easily be confident on the best in the world. He's uh, been on the longest win streak. You know, I mean, the guy that hasn't lost in that long, he's got to bring his A game every single time and into the cage. So he could be, you know. But uh, and everyone thought Anderson Silva was unbeatable. He thought they thought he was, you know, obviously he was the go at the time and uh, unbeatable. But you know, Wyman put it all together, and he's one of those guys that wasn't scared to get in the cage against him and uh, and knew and had a belief that he was going to win. And I feel like I'm in the same situation. I uh, I believe I can win and I've got to bring it to him. 
All right, now, TJ, uh, we're going to do something that's called the Submission Radio Tap Out Round, uh, where we fire off a bunch of questions, and you've got to answer them pretty quickly, kind of like word association. But before we do that, we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, we actually went out to the fans uh, on the forums, and we asked them what, what questions they had for you. So this is going to be their chance to get their ans- uh, their questions answered. Uh, I've got a couple. Now, Brazilian dude wants to know, do you expect a rematch against a Sun Sao at some point, and what would you do different? Yes, I expect the rematch with the Sinso after I win the belt. It'll be my first title defense. Green Giant wants to know, what's your biggest strength and worst fear? Biggest, biggest strength is how competitive I am and the, my will to win. Uh, my biggest fear, sharks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't like sharks. It's like that movie, or was it Shakando or something, where there's a tornado Shark-nado. and they came into my... Yeah, that, yeah made- that made me more afraid of sharks than any time before that. Yeah. I hear it's based on a true story. Uh, Camartino, what do you see as a weakness you can take advantage of against Barrao? And how do you plan on going to the deep rounds with his cardio? And what's the most important thing you need you need needed to beat Barrao, like pace or pressure or anything like that? He's greedy, Camartino. A lot of questions. <laughs> uh, keep, yeah, keep him as a defensive fighter and uh, be able to get into the late rounds. There's a lot of movement and uh, deal with his cardio. I feel like mine's better. That's it, guys. So if you have any more fan questions, just check us out at Submission Radio Oz on Twitter and send us some more questions over and we'll be happy to ask them in the interview. Now, right now, though, Cass, are you ready for the big tap-out round? I'm ready. TJ, are you ready for the Submission Radio tap-out round? Let's do it. Okay. (laughs) Okay, if a woman trains at your camp, does the name of the team change to Team Alpha Female? If a woman what? Trains at the camp at Team Alpha Male. Does the name of the team change to Team Alpha Female? <laughs> I don't think so. Now, we have a couple of uh, good girls that train in our gym already. They're part of Team Alpha Male. <laughs> okay. Next question. What's your craziest, drunkest story from Ukraine, preferably with vodka? Shoot. Um, I, don't, I wasn't drinking when I was out there. I was training. So I, I don't have any drunken stories. I mean, we saw a lot of drunken people, but uh, and I, was, I was sober. I was one of those people. Now, what's something about filming The Ultimate Fighter that we don't realize as viewers? They, they leave out a lot, of, uh, a lot of details and they change the timeline up of everything that's going on. They can make you whoever they want you to be on that show. Mm, interesting. Um, did you wrestle any bears in the Ukraine? <laughs> I did not. Only my boy Lance Palmer wrestled bears. That's crazy. Shout out to Lance Palmer. Now, who's the biggest practical jo- joker in Team Alpha Male? And you have to give us an example. The biggest practical joker is uh, Cecile. So say that again. It's just it's a bit hard to hear, TJ. What's that? One more time. You, you cut out a little bit. Say that again. Oh, I said the biggest practical joker is Danny Cecile. I moved up to the gym for the first time. Everyone was seemed like really cool dudes that were easy to get along with. But I wasn't too sure about Danny. It's because he's always joking with you and holds such a straight face while doing it. You know, he'll be joking with you and you have no idea because he looks serious, you know. And, and I don't think there's a time that he isn't joking when he's talking to you. <laughs> okay. Uh, team Alpha Male's favorite chick flick. Hmm. Dang, that's a tough one. There's so many of them that we, we fall in love with, you know. I mean, that's tough. <laughs> if you don't know, Bridget uh, Jones' diary of love actually are always safe ones. I'll have, to, I'll have to put that one on there. <laughs> that on the list, then, I guess. Now, TJ, you just mentioned yeah, that you love. Sorry, Sorry, continue. Tell us the chick flick. Yeah, I don't. I don't know who would be our number one chick flick. I'm not really sure. Okay, well, that's something for you to look at when you get home today, <laughs> and we want you to message us yeah. last night. Um, you mentioned how much you love Danny Castillo's jokes. Rate this one out of ten. A bear walks into a bar and asks a bartender for a gin and tonic. The bartender says, sure, but why the big pause? The bear replies, I was born with them. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. It took, it took me a second to get it, but I, mean, I wouldn't rate it very high, but it's a good joke. Well, we, we, I can't let you have the hook until you give me a number out of 10. Oh, out of 10? Uh, I'll give you a four. Okay, well, there we go. Right. <laughs> Another one from the fans. Good or Raslin wants to know, you either have to fight 10 horse-sized ducks or 100 duck-sized horses. Which do you pick and why? 
Oh, so wait, ask me the question one more time. Right. You either have to fight 10 horse sized ducks or 100 duck sized horses. And which one do you pick and why? That's a hard question. 10 horse sized ducks mm -hmm. or 100 uh, <laughs> horses that are a duck. I'd rather fight the horses that are a duck size. But there's 100 of them. Uh, I'd rather fight something that's a little bit. Yeah, there is 100 of them, but uh, I don't know. A duck that big, that seems pretty dangerous. So he's really eat me. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I think I'd rather go with the smaller animal, even though there's a bunch of them, as be able to boot them. I mean, a duck, I mean, the size of a duck's pretty easy. But a, a giant duck, I mean, that'd be able to, be able to swallow you whole, I think. You're a crazy man, TJ, because there, there would be a hundred of them. I would, I might <laughs> rather fight hen and brow than a hundred duck-sized horses. That would be insane. <laughs> I think so, too. I, I'd rather fight brow as well. I feel like that better as well. I feel like that should be the preparation for the hen and brow fight. You fighting a hundred duck-sized horses. <laughs> I don't know. Um, now, the name the Viper. Have you ever used that while trying to pick up a woman in a club or in a bar, using your nickname in a variety of ways? Uh, that's actually that's funny you guys asked me. That's not even my nickname. I got asked that on the UFC tonight as well. Um, funny story behind it. I was on the Ultimate Fighter. I've never had a nickname. I get off the show and I start looking at my record on Sure Dog to see if any of, the, if any of my, my fights from the show went on there. And all of a sudden, I just had a nickname, The Viper. I never put it on there. I never said my nickname was The Viper. I've never gone by it. And I've told, <laughs> I've told Sure Dog like three times that it's not my nickname, but they just they're leaving it. They think it's, uh, I guess they think it suits me and they just wanted to leave it there. Uh, uh, K4 and, and um, Michelle Sonnen asked me about it on UFC Tonight and I gave them the same answer. They're like, a little ridiculous. I don't even have that nickname. That's that's going to be the headlines coming out of this interview on Bloody Elbow and MMAfighting.com. He is not the Viper. He is not the Viper, I'm, folks. Yeah. Stop it. <laughs> now we want to get your, stop with these nicknames. We want to get your prediction as well. This this uh, this weekend, obviously UFC 172, John Jones versus Glover. Who are you picking? Mm -hmm. I'm picking John Jones. I feel like he got woken up in his fight against Gustafson, uh, maybe taking it a little more serious again. You know, I think he was getting too complacent with how good he was. Um, but Glover, man, he can he can knock him out at any point. You know, it's a tough guy to fight. But Jones is faster, more of the athlete. John Jones is going to win. There you guys go. That's a very that's a very straight answer. I like that. And now to finish up the tap out round, how are you finishing your fight at UFC 173 against Renan Brow for the bantamweight title of the world? Oof. I'm winning by unanimous decision in a five round fight. You know, it's going to be a tough one. And I'm going to win unanimously. There you go, guys. It's going to be an absolute war. And you can catch that fight yep. May 25th. That's UFC 173. And for all the Aussie listeners out there, that's May 25th for us. So we get to enjoy it on a cool Sunday. And you can follow TJ at TJ Dillashaw on Twitter. And check him out, guys. It's going to be an amazing fight. TJ, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. TJ, next time you come on, we're going to ask about the duck-sized horses and get, again in case you change your mind. And also, we're going to ask you about that chick flick again. So if you have the title, take some time and have a think about those questions. Yeah, it sounds like my homework is definitely watching some chick flicks. I haven't seen enough of them yet. Yeah, it's going, it's going to be an interesting <laughs> countdown to UFC 173. <laughs> yeah. So how have you gotten ready for this fight? Yeah, I've been watching nothing but chick flicks. <laughs> Thanks so much, TJ. You have a great day. Uh, no problem. Thank you, guys. All right, guys. So over the weekend, we obviously had the big UFC fight night. UFC on Fox 11, Verdum versus Travis Brown. Uh, big event. Didn't pull in a whole lot of numbers, uh, but there were some interesting fights on that card, and we're going to do a little bit of an analysis and breakdown on those. Uh, we'll start with the Thiago Alves versus Seth, versus Seth Baczynski fight on the prelims. Um, that was a fun little fight. Dennis, what did you think of that one? Yeah, you know, Seth was a gamer for that fight. He came in, he really, you know, he really tried to win that fight. I think Seth deserves a lot of credit for that fight. You know, Thiago walking away with a unanimous decision. You know, it was a long break for Thiago. Uh, for Thiago. And um, I think that, you know, he actually did quite well after such a long layoff, the number of injuries that he had. I'm excited to see uh, Thiago in the future. Yeah, I was really impressed with Thiago in that fight. Given, given how long his layoff was, Thiago came into that fight and he looked like he hadn't missed a beat. I mean, we saw those awesome leg kicks from Tiago inside, outside. He batted Seth's legs. Um, his boxing looked good. He didn't put Seth away, but it was it was a really good, fun fight. His uh, his takedown defense looked great. It'll be interesting to see how Tiago fares against the upper upper wrestlers of you know of the upper elite 
welterweight division, you know, your Tyron Woodley's, your Johnny Hendricks, guys like that. But against Seth Pachinski, he did great. And yeah, Seth Pachinski, what a gamer. He never stopped. He never backed down. Um, there was a few times where he got his legs kicked out from under him and he, he never gave up. He just kept, you know, putting pressure on Tiago and in the end, Tiago got the nod. But that was, that was a really great fight. Uh, up next on the main event of the prelims, we had Khabib Nurmagomedov against Rafael Dos Anjos. Um, Dennis, what are your thoughts on that one? Yeah, you know, Habib, you know, amazing wrestler, one of the big characters in the UFC. And, you know, the funny thing is there's a bit of a language barrier there, you know. Habib doesn't speak English. I think if he did, it'd be a lot more interesting. I think the guy has a lot of interesting things to say. Um, you know, Dos Anjos, he is a beast. You know, he is a great, great fighter. And seeing uh, Khabib uh, dominate the fight in the way that he did kind of really shows us how much of a talent this guy is, um, you know, how important people need to take him and, you know, how interesting his next few future opponents will be. Um, I really thought it was a great fight. You know, Habib showing his dominant skills. And um, we're going to have uh, Habib's uh, coach on the show next week um, to discuss uh, his situation. So I'm excited uh, to have a bit more of a, more of a chat with him then. Yeah, there's a lot of things I want to ask Javier Mendes of AKA when we have him on next week. But look, as far as Khabib goes, language barrier or not, the hat says it all. I mean, he comes out, he's all crazy. And uh, look, it, it's just another another guy in Rafael Dos Anjos who was, you know, ranked pretty highly in, in the lightweights, respectively. And Khabib really just dominated him. You know, he, he covered distance well, he got in there, and he out-wrestled someone who who really had improved his wrestling. We saw Rafael dominate uh, Cowboy Cerrone and become a very complete fighter, and he just really didn't have any answers for Khabib. So I, th- I think it's a good one. The only knock here is that, you know, Khabib versus Rafael Dos Anjos was the main event on a prelim card. I mean, I think Khabib should either mm. be on a pay-per-view or on the main card, but look, at the end of the day, it was another dominate, dom- dominant performance by Khabib. Onto the main card, you had the you had the Olympian wrestler Yol Romero against uh, Hawaiian striker Brad Tavares. Dennis, what were your thoughts on this one? Yeah, you know, um, one of the most exciting fighters for me is Yol Romero. You know, he's such an interesting guy, such a weird style. His striking style reminds me of something out of a Tekken or a Street Fighter game. And yeah. Brad Tavares, you know, he's a up and comer. He's had so many great victories back to back. This was really exciting for me to watch. Um, you know, I wasn't surprised that UL was able to dominate the fight. It seemed like he did take his wrestling a bit more seriously in this one. I think he usually lets things hang a bit more looser in other fights. But I think in this fight, he uh, came in with a good strategy, uh, dominated Brad Tavares, a nasty gash over Brad's, Brad's head. Um, you know, Cutman mm. doing a great job of uh, fixing that up. And, you know, a big win for UL Romero. Now, with Brad Tavares, I don't know if his stock goes down too much. I mean... I still think he's an exciting upcoming fighter, but it was just a tough matchup for him. Yeah, well, Yo Romero, he must not like us because we picked Brad Tavares to win and uh, he really he really messed up our predictions. But kind of doesn't surprise me that Yo won this one because in his last fight against Derek Brunson, he was a lot more wild, a lot more you know taking risks. And I think it was because Derek Brunson, he didn't really necessarily have the striking to threaten Yo. In Brad Tavares, obviously he had a very technical striker, someone with knockout power who could really hurt him. So... What we saw was a very, very complete y'all, someone who, who you know, put everything together. And uh, best of all, no shit stains, which I was happy about. <laughs> That's always a plus. And you know what? I saw a photo of him and Shaq. Shaq's a huge guy, just off topic. I saw that photo. I thought it was Shaq with, uh, with the game, the rapper. Yeah, or one of his sons. Because Yol looked so small next to him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But either way, great, great performance by Yol. That guy, that guy is definitely uh, moving up the ranks in the middleweight division. But up next, someone else who's uh, slowly moving up those ranks is uh, Donald Cowboy Cerrone versus uh, Edson Barboza. Dennis, what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, you know, Edson said he blinked and Donald caught him with that jab. Um, you know, Edson was dominating that fight at the start. Great striking, landed some great combinations, great kicks. Uh, Donald looked like he was a little bit stunned by a few of these punches. Not stunned in the sense that it affected him in terms of, you know, he was getting concussed, but stunned is in the fact that Edson was being able to dominate in such a fashion. Um, but, you know, it, a fight's a fight and anything can happen in MMA. That jab... Um, after it happened, you know, I knew what was going to happen next. You've said it yourself, Cass. He jumps on a submission as soon as he hurts the fighters. It's a great, it's a great uh, follow-up to stunning someone. You know, he jumped right into that rear naked choke. And a huge win for Donald Cerrone. More motorcycles, dirt bikes, and whatever else he spends his money on. Apparently, the guy makes it rain. 
He does. He does make it rain. He uh, he used to go with Brittany Palmer. Fun fact. Um, yeah. Oh, they broke up. They uh, broke uh, up. Is, she, yeah. is he with uh, Rochelle Leon now? It wouldn't surprise me. The ultimate he man's might be. man, Cowboy Cerrone, wouldn't surprise me. He is the man's man. He is. Um, yeah, it's actually funny because during that fight, I was explaining to somebody's the way Donald, you know, he fights. He's a very slow starter. He gets into it. He gets into these wars. And if he's going to, you know, even though he's such a great striker and kickboxer and his Muay Thai is great. Um, actually, I'd say more kickboxing. You know, he rocks guys and then he jumps on a submission. And uh, pretty much on cue, that's exactly what happened. And you know, you, ha- you have Edson Barboza, who's a, who's a terrific fighter in his own right. He obviously had the speed advantage over Donald in this one. And I think it was partially Edson was just really on, and he had that speed advantage. But also, Cowboy was taking a while to start up. As usual, he's like that old trusty car, you know, it takes a while to start up. Mm. But once he's rolling, you know, he dominates. And um, it, it kind of looked at the start like this could be the end of Cowboy's, you know, gatekeeper reign. But, you know... Another bonus, another submission of the night later, and uh, yeah, he'll be he'll be wakeboarding once more. If, uh, if 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 I'm a part of Donald's camp, I'm going away from that thinking that he's got some improvement to do if he wants to hang in there with the top echelon in the division. I think it's pretty predictable now that Cowboy is a slow starter. Mm-hmm. People use that to their advantage. So what can you do to change that? What can Donald do to you know get in the zone quicker? You know, a famous Australian fighter, George Sopropoulos, um same same problem first round slow starter people took advantage of it they uh as soon as he went up the division people knew that in that first round they're going to inflict the damage onto george and i think a similar thing's happening to donald now but just on edson to me his stock goes down sure he did a great job but it still he got finished dominantly in the first round no matter how great he did before that happened no matter if he blinked or not for me edson's stock goes down yeah, I think Edson gets thrown into that pile of fighters who have a lot of promise and they have a lot of talent, but they're not necessarily utilizing it. You know, Eric Silva had that same problem and he's going to get a chance to uh, redeem himself. But for now, Edson is a guy with a lot of hope, but, you know, hasn't quite produced the goods just yet. Um, speaking of someone who had a lot of promise, uh, Misha Tate versus <laughs> Liz Carmouche. Uh, what, did you, what was your take on this one, Dennis? Yeah, you know, Misha Tate came out to a pit bull... And uh, Kesha song, as soon as that happened. First mistake. I, oh, it was first mistake. If you follow us at Submission Radio, at Submission Oz, you would see, and that's AUS for all the people <laughs> keeping track over there. Um, you would see that, you know, we did tweet and we predicted the fact that that song would take something away from it, and it did. Look, I think Misha's last fight, there was a lot of stress. There was a lot of build up. She came in that one, had a bit of a crappy game plan, but, you know, d- did an all right job. This one, it, it seemed like uh, Misha was going to the frozen yogurt place to get a delicious cup of frozen yogurt. Like you would, could not tell that Cupcake had a fight. And um, when she came in there, she looked like she wanted to sit down on the couch and lounge around. Those first two rounds were so unimpressive that I just didn't know what was going on. You know, she picked up in the third round and, you know, she impressed us, she showed us what she could do. But is it enough of an excuse to come out and do a performance like that in the first two rounds? I don't think so, especially when you haven't gotten your first win in the UFC. Now, Liz Carmouche, I think she should have been more aggressive. She was a great wrestler. She wrestled very well in the first two rounds. But when you, when you have them on the ground, you've got to throw some punches. You've got to do something. You can't just hold on to their, uh, to their legs and just keep them down. Now, if Liz did throw more punches, if she was more aggressive... In my personal opinion, I think she would have won that fight. But because, you know, it, it was just uh, Liz's game was just, I just want to hold her down and sort of win this fight. You know, it really cost her in the end. What do you think, Cass? Yeah, I would agree. And I think, um, you know, Ronda Rousey said something interesting before their fight about how Mish is just a college wrestler, or I think a high school wrestler even. And I didn't give pro- much props to her wrestling. And we saw Liz Carmouche, you know, stuffing a lot of her takedown defense, uh, sorry, takedown attempts. And I think Misha might be reaching that glass ceiling where, you know, she, she got this one over Kamush, but people are starting to figure her out. And she hasn't exactly looked spectacular in any of her UFC fights without any offense. I mean, she obviously lost to Kat Zingano. This one is a really close one. Then she got, you know, obliterated by Ronda Rousey for the second time. So I think mm. Misha needs to come up with some, some better game plans. She needs to fight yes. a little bit smarter. Um... Yeah, I, 
I don't know. Otherwise, she could become, you know, the rampage of the division who, you know, goes out, gets emotional and, and doesn't really, you know, stick to a proper game plan. I'd be very mm. curious what the game plan was, you know, from the, from the, from the Tate camp. Yeah, and you know what? That's probably the issue. You know, and I'm sure Brian Caraway and her camp, um, you know, have a great game plan and set for her, and they've practiced it. But I just think she is an example. One of those fighters, much like Rampage, when they get in the ring, it's sort of anything goes, and you can really see that with Misha. And um, just yeah, it's just an unimpressive uh, thing to watch, and it's also a big waste. So I mean, she's gotten her first win in the UFC. She's not getting cut by any means. You know, she's one of the biggest names. Um, in the UFC when it comes to the women's division. And, you know, neither will Liz Kamush. You know, she's got a bit of a following as well. Mm. But i just like to see some of these female fighters, some of these women fighters really put a game plan together and really put their skills together because sometimes it is difficult to watch. And for me personally, that wasn't a women's MMA fight that I enjoyed watching in the first two rounds. Sure, last round, Liz got out of that Rene could choke. It was exciting. But those first two rounds, I felt like I was in one of those smokers Smokers rooms with the amateur boxing fights where, you know, you're sort of looking at the fight going, I don't know how these guys are doing it. Mm, wasn't the greatest. Um, as You know, as far as the main event, though, for Breeds Over Doom, Travis Brown, this is the one that probably caused the biggest reaction of the night. And I think we're going to disagree on some things in this one, Dennis. What did you think of the fight? Well, you know, you and me predicted Travis Brown by knockout. Um, I predicted bone crunching knockout if it uh, makes any difference. Mm. Um I think Fabricio of Doom is going to be one of those cases, and you and me might uh, think differently on this, but I'm actually of the opinion that he's one of the most underrated fighters um, in the heavyweight division right now. Look, um, I was going to say, I would agree with you there. If you look at some of the big names that he's beaten, he beat Fedor and he beat Nagera. Now, those guys were both at some point considered the best heavyweights in the world. In theory, if he beats Cain Velasquez, and that's that's a theory, you know, um, if he beats Cain Velasquez, you could argue that he is the greatest heavyweight in the world. So I'd say he is underrated. But fin finish what you were saying, Dennis. Well, you know, what I was going to say was that um, one of the things going for Fabricio in the last few fights is, you know, he improves every fight that you see him in. Um, I actually think this is the best Fabricio I've seen mm. um, in this Travis Brown fight. You know, people were talking about cardio, including us. Will he have issues with cardio? Um, you know, he'll gas. It's a five-round fight. And he looked absolutely amazing in this fight. Now, granted, Travis Brown broke a rib, broke a hand, broke a bone in his foot. And that obviously slows a fighter down, decreases your breathing, especially the fact that you broke it early on in the fight. But let's not forget who broke those bones. It was Fabricio Vadum. Um, he came out there. He absolutely took took care of Travis Brown in that ring, was throwing amazing combinations, looked great um, in the stand-up department, and just really showed us uh, a Fabrizio we're doing we've never seen before. Now, when it comes to his fight for the title, I don't know if he's got the weapons to beat Kane. Um, obviously, Kane's an amazing wrestler. He's on another level. But I'm a lot more excited for his Kane matchup now than I was before. Yeah, see, I think that's that's why I didn't like this fight that much. And I know a lot of people loved it. A lot of people said things like heavyweights throwing wheel kicks and this and that. That's that's all well and good. And I, I love a good brawl, but that's not what this was. And those wheel kicks, to me, they didn't have any substance. It's all it's all well and good to throw wheel kicks. But it's kind of like, uh, you know, Chael Sonnen when he did that little flip at UFC 117 against Anderson Silva. Yeah, it was cool, but, you know, you can't really have a fight based around that. Uh, there was some funny moments. Travis Brown walking away, acting like he's going to walk away, and then that you know sneaky sidekick. I like things like that. But <laughs> the sneaky side. What about the sneaky kip up from Fabricio Vadum? Ah, uh, Shawn Michaels before before he lost his smile. See, that's another thing that I was like, Fabricio, what are you doing, man? You, you're going to gas like that. But look, in all all due respect, Fabricio looked fantastic. He had the much more technical striking. Um, I don't even think it was necessarily a game plan, but he put everything together. He had technical striking. He out-wrestled Travis Brown. I mean, he absolutely outclassed him. Literally outclassed Travis Brown. The reason why I wasn't a big fan of that fight is I think a lot of it was also due to how bad Travis Brown looked. I mean, my expectations from the fight, obviously a knockout from Travis Brown. I thought Fabrizio couldn't handle Travis's athleticism, his strength, his, uh, his footwork. And all those things proved to, you know, not mean a single thing. And the thing is, even though I think Cain Velasquez would wipe the floor with both guys, no offense, I kind of thought, look, Travis Brown, if he puts on a nice dominant performance against Fabrizio, at least we could, you know, somewhat start believing that 
hey, maybe Travis could actually beat Cain Velasquez. Maybe, you know, with some kind of sneaky flying knee or, or something, or maybe if he showed impeccable takedown defense, then maybe he could beat Cain Velasquez. Instead, we got Fabricio Verdum coming out on top with a great victory. But all that really says to us is we, you know, what we already knew, and that's that Fabrizio Verdum, as good as he is, and he did look great, he's not beating Cain Velasquez anytime soon. So that, that's what I was disappointed about. Then you, you mix in all those random, you know, spinny wheel kicks and this and that. I just, I was very, very, very disappointed by, by Travis Brown's showing. I mean, here's the other thing about Travis Brown. With his striking, he follows very much a pattern. It's kind of like he's got combinations in his head um, and he, he goes by those combinations. The thing is, for Travis's combinations to work, his opponent needs to react to those. And Fabrizio didn't react to any of those combinations. He... He didn't react to them, and therefore, none of them worked for Travis Brown. And that was when he was throwing combinations. For the most part, there was no setup on his punches. He was just throwing wild haymakers, which, again, I, f I found to be extremely, extremely disappointing. I mean, Fabrizio's not a dumb guy. He's been around the block. And with his technical boxing that he showed in this fight, there's no chance that he was going to get, you know, clipped or winged with one of Travis's shots. Add to the fact that Travis Brown absolutely gassed after the first round. I, I wasn't a big fan of this fight. I kind of thought this is what people talk about when they, you know, complain about heavyweights gassing and, you know, being being lethargic. However, all all respect to Verdun because he did look spectacular in this fight. Well, you know, um, Dana White had a similar opinion after the fight. Um, he spoke about uh, Travis Brown's injuries and how he gassed quickly. But, you know, just from my personal opinion, I don't think uh, Dana White should be talking about that. I mean, at the end of the day, Verdum's the one who made who did the damage to Brown. And, you know, I agree, yeah, Brown did gas, but I think a lot of us thought it was exciting because no one really gave Fabricio, you know, much of a chance in this one. Everybody expected Travis to go out there and take care of business. Now, if Travis did gas because of the rib injury, um, and I, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt, then, you know, I'll just put this down to a bad performance. You know, Travis's stock has gone down quite significantly, and um, I'd like to see him possibly fight uh, fight Bigfoot Silva at the end of the year when Bigfoot, when Bigfoot can come back from his suspension. I think uh, Travis will take a little bit of time to come back from all his injuries. That could be a great rematch. Um, but to be honest with you, this fight won me over as a fan for Fabricio Verdum. So when this match happens with Kane, although um, you know Kane will be the favorite, uh, I might be going for Fabricio Verdum, and it's just because you know he's just a gamer to me, and you know I really enjoyed the way he fought. Now, um, what's going to happen? I'm not sure, but I'll tell you what, uh, it was definitely something that not many people expected in the journalism realm of MMA or in the fan realm as well. I think Fabrizio Verdum definitely has the ability to shock. I still think... I'm still not giving him much of a chance against Kane. And I almost feel like I'm damning myself by saying that. I almost feel like there's going to be some kind of, you know, shock shock surprise just because of that. But I think if you look at, if you look at what happened in this fight, Travis Brown doesn't have the technical striking, you know, that Kane does. Kane is not only a much more technical striker... He also mixes things up a lot better than Verdum, and he's a lot faster. I think those are the big factors. Not only that, but his relentless pace, um, I think, is going to give Verdum fits. I mean, I think one of the reasons why I didn't you know, think he was going to have much success was because of his fight against Nogueira. I don't think Fabrizio looked that great when he was backing up, and Nog was making it back up with his boxing. Fabrizio looked, you know, he looked a little bit flustered. Um, I think Kane is going to have, you know, that effect, but a lot more, you know, he's, he's going to be able to capitalize where Nagara didn't, when Nagara didn't necessarily have that athleticism and quickness. I think Kane is going to, you know, absolutely put on a clinic. And I think another thing with Travis Brown, something you got to remember is, you know, he's been quite highly touted, but he's only been doing MMA for five years. A lot of the reactions from getting punched for him are very, very raw. You know what I mean? It's very, if, if someone punches you in the face, chances are you're going to turn your cheek. And that's something that he needs to get out of his system. But obviously, because he's only been doing that for five years, he doesn't necessarily have the experience to get rid of those bad habits. So I think it's going to be back to the drawing board for Travis Brown. Uh, Mike Winklejohn's definitely going to have some work to do with him. But yeah, as far as Fabrizio Verdum, look, I hope they do it in Mexico. I, I hope it gets, you know, crazy pay-per-view buys, and I hope the Latin community gets behind it. 
um, and everybody sings and dances and eats old El Paso afterwards. And I hope it's great. But just to be honest, I'm, I'm giving the edge to Kane in a big, big way. And I think even even if it goes to the ground, which we saw Fabrizio Verdum on top of Travis Brown, and there was, not, you know, we didn't see any submissions. I think Kane being the far better fighter, he's got it covered, you know, on all corners. Yeah, no doubt about it. But I think one of the other things about Fabricio is, and I know um, you've mentioned some of his pre- previous fights, but with this fight coming up, I don't think I'll look at his previous fights. I think the thing with Fabricio is every fight you see a different fighter. And, I, you know, I think his chance will come if when he fights Kane, we see a big improvement from the improvement that we've already seen. Um, but there'll definitely be some interesting questions. No doubt um, it's going to be a great fight. And I think one of the things we are looking overlooking here is, you know, Fabricio Verdum, he's 36 years old. I mean, he doesn't look that old, but the guys are constantly improving. Started out as a, a jiu-jitsu guy, really improved his striking, really come into his own, has some great wins. Looks like he's taken care of his cardio problem, which is one of the main things, um, which is one of the main things that was hindering him from a five-round title fight. Obviously, Obviously, that's going to change now that Kane's going to be going for the takedowns, putting the weight on him. But I'll just be interested to see that fight. I think I will be interested to see that fight. And with Travis Brown, you know, he has been in MMA for five years and those reflexes don't come very often. But, you know, it's still, I just feel like Travis Brown, you know, didn't really have a good outing. And sometimes these things happen. And I agree with you, you know, Winkle John does have a lot of work. Um, to do when they go back into camp. But, um, you know, it's interesting. It'll be interesting to find out from his next fight how much of this was due to injury and how much of this was just due to the fact that it was a skill set problem. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to put it, chalk it up to a bad performance. I think also Travis needs to learn that, you know, when you're, when you're, in, when you're up at this level, you can't stand in front of your opponent and taunt them and get cocky when you're losing that fight, you know, like Overeem did the same thing against, against mm. Bigfoot Silva and paid for it dearly. I wouldn't say he really did that against Travis Brown. I think he just gassed, but yeah, I think Travis needs to learn that you can't do that in, in the cage, you know, especially in the UFC where the, the level is so high and, you know, a loss can put you down, can really set you back far. And obviously a win for, for Risa Verdum can put you up into, you know, title contention. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, I, d- I agree with you. You know, he we, we've spoken about the whole uh, cocky factor going into a fight, and I actually do feel like Travis Brown overlooked Fabrizio Verdum. I actually felt like that happened in this fight, and I do think that was one of the issues going into this fight. You know, he didn't, you know, take maybe uh, Verdum striking seriously, and, you know, all the taunting, although I think it might have been a tactic to try and uh, make Verdum to make a mistake, I don't think it was a good look for Travis Brown, so... It'll, you know, it'll be interesting to see where he goes from here. But coming up this weekend is the big one, UFC 172. It's been a while since we've had a card where everybody's buzzed about it, excited about it, can't wait to see what's going to happen. You know, I'm one of those people, you know, this is a great card. Well, it's been a while since we've had a pay-per-view period. And, uh, yeah, I'm in the same boat. I'm super excited about this one. And you mentioned the overconfidence factor. And I'm putting a question out there uh, for anyone listening on Stitcher, iTunes, TuneIn, or even YouTube. Uh, let us know. Do you think John Jones is coming into this one perhaps a little bit overconfident? I think I think in the last few weeks, especially, I think he's really honed in, and I think he's really taken Glover seriously. But he, here's the thing, you know, he's he's got the whole world. You know, looking at him, he's got the whole world praising him about how he's the greatest champion and this and that, and when's he going to versus Gustafsson and Cormier and and him and him and this guy. Um, I'm wondering if, you know, despite what what he says, I'm wondering if he's overlooking Glover because I think on paper, I think on paper, John Jones is a very good matchup for Glover, but I I don't know. I don't know. I I don't want to read too much into this one-punch knockout power, but I'm still curious what Glover has. I think we've still not seen that much of Glover in the UFC. What do you think, Dennis? Yeah, I agree with you. Now, we'll have a bit of a chat about it when we get to the fight, but um, I do think one of these... This cocky factor for John Jones is an integral part of his game because um, he needs to have belief in himself when he walks into the octagon that he can go in there and dominate a guy. Now, some fighters, they don't need that kind of cockiness, um, they just need to believe in themselves. Um, if you don't believe in yourself in fighting, basically, you can't do anything. I think one of the reasons why John is so good is because he believes in himself so much. He's so cocky. And, you know, sometimes it costs him, but um, that's, that's the thing that I wanted to mention. If he doesn't have that cocky factor after that Alexander Gustafsson fight, you know, taking some wind out of his sail, what kind of John Jones will we see then? You know what I mean? So it'll, I'll be interested to chat about that when we get to the fight. But kicking off... 
uh, the card, uh, one of the fights that I really want to talk about is this Danny Castillo, Charlie Brenneman fight. You know, Charlie's back in the UFC. He was cut previously. And Danny, you know, one of the bigger names from Team Alpha Male on the Fight Pass card. What do you reckon, Cass? Yeah, I mean, he, he's, he's main eventing the pre-prelims. So it, it, it's crazy just to see how much talent we have that, you know, th- this, is, this is the main event of the pre-prelims. Um, I think I think it's going to be an interesting one. You know, Charlie Charlie Brenneman. He's he's been very I'd say hit and miss. Uh, he was he's obviously got good wrestling, but so does Danny. So I think this one's going to be a mostly stand up affair, and I think for that it's it's going to be I think it's going to be a good fun fight. Um, I've got Danny winning this one just because he's been a lot more consistent recently. Obviously, uh, Charlie Brenneman lost his last fight against uh, uh, Ben El Dariush. That was at uh, UFC Fight Night Rockhold versus Philippou. So, uh, look, I've, I've definitely got Danny winning this one. I've got him winning it by decision. What about you, Dennis? Well, you know, I think it is a bit of a travesty. You put a guy on the fight pass card after he loses a close decision to Edson Barbosa, really, in December. I really think that that's a little bit unfair. Now, um, Danny was in an interview on the MMA hour, and he mentioned that it could be a case of them wanting people to buy the fight pass card. You know, you got to put someone on there with some name recognition to get people to want to buy the fight pass card. But, um... I really do think it is very, very low on the card, and I hope it doesn't affect his sponsorship money too much. Now, with Charlie Brenneman, you know, he came in on a very on very short notice. You know, he was cut from the uh, UFC. He won four fights outside the UFC. Like you mentioned, he, his previous fight was a loss in the first round, very decisive. I think this is the uh, opportunity that he gets for taking that fight. Um, but for Charlie, you know, I'm pretty sure this is win or go home. So I'm... I like Charlie Brenneman a lot. You know, he's a great fighter, but I think Danny Castillo is going to walk through him. And I really, uh, you know, I really be interested to see who Danny fights next because, like I mentioned, Danny had a great fight against Edson Barbosa. Um, he is, uh, he is 34 years old, so he's still rather young, and you know, he's he's got a great set of skills. So I really do want to see Danny challenged in his next fight. But moving on to the next fight that I'm interested in from UFC 172, um, the 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 Joseph Benavides Tim Elliott fight now um Joseph Benavides is on the prelims the main event of the prelim what do you think about that again I think I think it's pretty crazy because this is a guy who not long ago was I believe main eventing you know Fox cards but at the same time you're right someone's someone's got to be on there someone's going to main main event it and I think it's just another reason for people to tune into that one uh yeah him him and Tim Elliott I think that's interesting Tim Elliott recently lost to Ali Bagutinov. But again, Ali Bagutinov's a stiff test. Um, I think a lot of what Ali does, Joseph Benavidez does a little bit better. I think Ali might have the... Who do you think has the better wrestling, Ali or Joseph? I have to go with Joseph on this one, and just because he comes from such a strong wrestling camp. Yeah, I'd, I'd say Ali, Ali's got more of a Sambo background, but I think Joseph Benavidez has the better pure wrestling. Um, I think if, if, if Tim Elliott struggled against Ali Bagutinov, I think he's going to struggle even more so against Joseph Benavides. So I think this is another fight for for Benavides to basically uh, fast track him to another title shot. Mm, but you know, and I feel bad for Joseph Benavides. You know, we'll, and we'll try and get him on the show after um, after the fight. But I think the guy's a little bit stuck. You know, he's had a couple of losses for the title. Where do you go next? Can you sell another title fight? I mean, I know he'll be looking to have a dominant knockout win um, in this fight. He's going to need to make a statement in this fight. Uh, will he be able to? You know, time will tell. Tim Elliott is a, you know, a game opponent, but I feel bad for Joseph Benavides. Now he's the main event of a prelim. I mean, more people watch the prelims than the pay-per-view. That's for sure. Um, a lot more people see you and more eyes are on you, especially if they re- replay your fight um, during the pay-per-view. But I think it's a little bit not, but a little bit of a knock for Joseph. Um, much like Danny, I think he wants to be on the pay per view. Yeah, I think uh, you know Benavides kind of has that Junior dos Santos factor where he's already versed the champion a couple of times. He's lost the first one was a really close fight. The second one was a brutal knockout, and it's kind of like where do you go from there? I don't see you know Benavides getting another t- title shot anytime soon. I think Ali Bagutinov has the next title shot. Um, and after that, you know, there, there isn't a crazy big list. I think if anything, he would get a title shot just because the, the 125 division isn't really all that deep. But yeah, I would agree. If you look at his losses over the over his career, he's only lost to Dominic Cruz twice and Demetrius Johnson twice. I mean, that's a pretty crazy record. He's, he's versed a lot of guys, um, a who's who, including Eddie Wineland, uh, you know, Honey Yaya, Miguel Torres, 
uh, Ian McCall, you know, who's your former guy? There's, there's a lot of guys on that list. So I think even though he's lost twice to Demetrius Johnson, unless we have some other clear, clear contenders, I think we'll probably see them, you know, having, having a third fight sooner than later. And I mean, you know, Demetrius Johnson, um, you know, pound for pound, one of the best fighters in the world. If he loses the title, you know, I see Benavides jumping right in there. So that could also be a possibility for Benavides. Now moving up the card, we have uh, Andre Tachifili, which is a great nickname, versus Max Holloway. Uh, Andre Tachifili coming out of the Team Alpha Male camp. A little fun fact, when he first went into the camp, he had one of those uh, bracelets on his ankle, one of those uh, bracelets that you get sort of uh, when you get arrested. You know what I'm talking about, Cass? Yes, because I've been arrested so many times. Well, there you go. I'm, I'm with a criminal here. But um, yeah, so he had one of those ankle bracelets on um, while he trained at Team Alpha Male. Wait, you, mean, uh, you mean one of those ones like in Wolf of Wall Street, where if he leaves the premises, it goes off? That's right, yeah. And um, he, wasn't, he, couldn't, he didn't have to live at the gym. But yeah, he had one of those uh, bracelets on. And the fun thing was that, um, and he mentioned this in an interview, um, if he damaged it, he'd have to pay to fix it up himself. And it was really, really expensive. So he couldn't throw kicks uh, at the gym with the, with that leg. Yeah, I bet. I wouldn't want to cop a, a head kick with, with one of those ankle bracelets. Uh, but that, that's crazy. That's insane. Uh, and look at him now fighting in the UFC. Um, what, you know what's funny about that is obviously, you know, with, with he, him and his ankle bracelets, he's obviously got a little bit of controversy as far as his past goes. Not that it's really, you know, publicized. Uh, his opponent, Max Holloway, his last fight was against Will Chope, who also had some controversy as far mm. as his past. Um, having said that, I'd say Max Holloway, he's been, he's been fairly inconsistent. I like this guy, you know, he's got a, he's got a good fighting style. He's an exciting fighter. I always look forward to his fights. Uh, he's lost to Conor McGregor and Dennis Bermudez, who aren't any kind of slouches themselves. I think against uh, Andre Feely, though, uh, I think he's a little bit outclassed, and I think Andre is going to make an example of him and continue the team alpha male uh, trend of dominant fighters. Yeah, you know, Andre Tachi Feely, like you said, tenders life round, and I think TJ spoke about it a little bit. Not a clean cut guy, has these big earring, uh, ear things that he puts in his ear, you know, has the tats, the, the hair, and I uh, spoke a little bit, a little bit about his previous history, street fighting, and. Um, issues with his family and it's great to see the kid turn everything around and you know really focus and he's only 23 years old um, Max is only 22 years old so we are looking at some of the you know young guys some of the future uh, some of the future guys in the division and that's always great to see and I agree with you you know I think Andre has the edge on this one but you know Max is no slouch like you said he's had experience against some game opponents so it'll be interesting to see uh, what happens there mm. Next fight on the card, we've got Jim Miller against Yancey Medeiros. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Now, this is an interesting fight. Jim Miller, not too long ago, was considered the number two in the lightweight division, or at least thereabouts. He's, his stock has dropped significantly over the last few years, um, obviously losing to Nate Diaz. Uh, who else? He lost to, to Pat Bam Bam Healy. Now, he's versus Yancey uh, Medeiros. Now, who, who lost to Rustam Kabalov and Eve Edwards. Uh, who re He originally won that fight. He only lost because the, the Athletic Commission overturned it due to him testing positive for marijuana, which is, again, another hot topic, MMA. Does it really, you know, enhance your performance? I think not. Um, but, yeah, he's, 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 versing, he's versing Yancey on only the second card of the night. I think, so on the second fight of the card, I think this is going to be an exciting fight, but I think this is Jim Miller's fight to get back on the wagon. What do you think, Dennis? Well, you know, Yancey comes out of Yancey. And, you know, by the way, Casper's dog's name is Yancey. So that, there's, a, there's an interesting fact there. You know, Yancey trains with uh, Nate Diaz, Nick Diaz, um, Gilbert Melendez. So he's no slouch. You know, he, he trains with some of the best in the world. Uh, fun fact about Yancey was he walked around. Are you ready for this, Cass? I'm waiting. He walked around 245 pounds. That's right, 245 pounds earlier on in his MMA career. And if we look at the guy's record, if we look at his record, he began fighting um, He began fighting in, a much, in 2007, and I believe in a much higher weight class. I believe, I believe it was in light heavyweight or something like that. Yeah, I forgot to mention, actually, sorry. He, he, when he debuted in the UFC, UFC 159, he debuted lightweight. He used to be middleweight which is pretty crazy, but he started fighting at light heavyweight. 
So, yeah. Come, I mean, that's nuts. Well, Walking from, around at 245. Yeah, coming from his, his last fight before uh, the UFC, uh, before UFC 159, was Strike Force v- Fedor versus Verdum. That was 2010. Three years later, uh, almost exactly three years later, he came in at a lightweight. So the dude has either been training his ass off or he's been on the Callista Flockhart diet. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And he did mention he's had a whole bunch of injuries that kept him from coming back. Um, you know, but he what he said was training with the Nate Diaz, Nick Diaz, Gilbert Melendez, you know, watching what the, how they eat, how they train, pretty much the weight just came off. And um, now he's at his premium weight uh, fighting Jim Miller, and he's a hungry kid. Now, his manager called up the UFC and demanded this fight once Jim's... Uh, previous opponent pulled out so Yancey isn't there just because Dana White called him and asked him to be there Yancey's there because he wants to be there he wants to be one of the best fighters in the world and this is a big fight for him if he wins it um, it does a lot for Yancey's stock but if Jim loses this fight I mean his like you said his stock's been going down it's going to take a huge plunge like Wolf of Wall Street yeah, I, you know, I like these stories when a guy comes in out of nowhere. Charlie Brenneman, who's on the card, are the same thing against Rick Story. You know, last minute pull out by, I believe, Nate Marquardt. Uh, yeah, Nate Marquardt. And uh, he ended up winning the fight. So we'll see what Yancey can do. But like you said, the, Jim Miller really is on the chopping block here. If he if he loses this fight, his stock's going to drop massively. Now, the next fight, on, over, uh, the next fight uh, coming up on the card is Tim Bosch versus Luke Rockhold. Uh, you know, Tim Bosch... Uh, Probably one of the more underrated fighters in the UFC. Um, not a lot of people expected him to win some of the fights that he's won. This is Luke Rockhold, someone that had a very, very impressive last win. Um, but looks like, you know, he didn't really get the fight that he wanted. You know, he wanted Michael Bisping. That didn't work out. So now he's got Tim. Uh, you know, he defeated Costas Filippo in the main event by the KO to the body at uh, Fight Night Rockhold versus Filippo back in January. Uh, what do you reckon, Kaz? Do you think that this fight does much for Luke? Um, look, I think Luke is obviously the heavy, heavy, heavy favorite in this fight. I think Tim Boach at the same time, I mean, he may not be, you know, elite title contender. I'm pretty sure he's outside of the top 10 now, and I'm worried that he's not going to be in the EA UFC game. Uh, I think as far as what the fight would do for him, look, it's it's still a big win uh, beating Tim Boach. I mean, he hasn't had a, a lot of losses in his career. Uh, and I think... I think Tim Bosch and Costa Filippo, they're more or less on the same level. So I think they're slowly trying to build up uh, Luke Rockhold. The thing is, he doesn't have that many years. I mean, he is... Uh, where is he? Where is his... 33. 33. So there you go. If, if they're going to build him up, they need to hire it up a little bit. Um, I think it was also due to the fact that everyone else is tied up. Tim Bosch's uh, last couple of losses were Costa Filippo and Mark Munoz. And his uh, last win was against CB Dolloway. Uh, Luke Rockhold, on the other hand, I mean, he beat, he viciously destroyed Costas Philippou, lost to Vitor Belfort. Before that, he was beating guys like Tim Kennedy, Keith Jardine, uh, Jack Array, you know, Paul Bradley, Jesse Taylor, TJ Money, and the list goes on. He's got great, great striking, and he's no joke on the ground. Um, I think this is Luke Rockhold's fight to lose. Having said that, Tim Bosch, I mean, he does win fights that he's not supposed to win. You know, who could forget that awesome comeback in the Yushin Okami fight in Japan with those incognito uppercuts against the cage. And I think that's that's going to be his game plan. Bosch is going to want to get in against the cage and make it a dirty fight, try to get into that clinch and, uh, and take him down and rough him up against the cage. I think Luke Rockhold, however, he's a big dude. He's a big, strong dude. Um, I think he's he's six foot three. He's a big middleweight, and uh, I think given his reach as well, uh, I I think he's going to give Tim Boach fits all night with his with his striking. He'll keep him at distance, um, and I'm predicting I'm predicting probably a, a knockout by Luke Rockhold in the second or third. Yeah, and just a correction there. Um, Tim Boach is thirty three, and Luke Rockhold is twenty nine. Sorry about that. Now you're right. He is a big guy. You know, Tim Boach coming down from a higher weight class. You know, he is quite strong for the weight class as well. I see Luke using this fight as an exhibition to propel himself to the next level. And another story of a guy who came over from Strike Force, sort of had the world at his hands, and had an unfortunate dominant loss against Vitor Belfort, and sort of got lost in the mix. Um, now that he's got that really decisive win against Costa Filippo, another decisive of when gets him back in the picture and gets him another big fight i think in the ufc um i think luke is such a talented guy and um you know it's sort of his fight to lose but in saying that like we said if tim wins this fight you know he's back in the picture 
So this is a great opportunity for Tim Birch. I don't think he's the kind of guy that tries to avoid a difficult fight. And I think he loves being the underdog. So we've seen it happen before. It could happen again. Yeah, I think Tim really relishes these fights. And I think to a degree, sometimes it can be easier being the underdog because everybody overlooks you. And I don't think Luke's the type of guy to come in overconfident. But you never know. Tim does, you know, he, he is the type of guy to upset a lot of fighters. Um, speaking of possible upsets, we've got the next fight. Another, we've got two light heavyweight fights on the card. Before we get to the main event, we've got Phil Davis and we've got Anthony Rumble Johnson. Now, this is an interesting story. Rumble Johnson, obviously, welterweight, massive, massive, massive welterweight. For many years, uh, a lot of problems with cutting weight. In his middleweight debut or supposed debut, he missed weight by, I don't know, a lot. It was like nine, nine pounds or something against Vitor Belfort. Ended up getting choked out, kicked out of the company. Uh, toiled in World Series of Fighting, where he even fought at heavyweight and defeated Andre Arlovsky. Now he's back. He's been training with the uh, Black Zillions, and he's versing another possible title contender in Phil Davis. How do you see this fight going down, Dennis? I'm a big Anthony Johnson fan. You know, Phil, um, Phil has a lot of hype behind him, but let's have a look at Phil's record for a second before we start uh, talking about this fight. Now, uh, Phil's last fight was against... Uh, Leo Machida, which he won in a decision, unanimous decision. Uh, he Before that, he won a fight with Vinny Megales in another unanimous decision. And before that, he bought, he beat Wagner Parado with a submission and a condo choke in the second round. Um, basically, you know, I think Phil is a great fighter, but I don't want to give him the benefit of the doubt just yet. I think he still has a little bit to prove in the octagon before we start putting him up there with the likes of John Jones. Now, when it comes to... Uh, when it comes to Anthony Johnson, you know, he has, he is a very exciting fighter and he has extreme knockout power. He's a very, very strong guy, even now that he's back up to light heavyweight. So I'm not going to count Anthony Johnson out. As a matter of fact, for me, Anthony is the favorite in this fight. Now, what can Phil do? Phil can use his takedowns, use his wrestling, uh, take Anthony down and really frustrate Anthony, tire him out and then beat him. But who knows what kind of Phil Davis is going to come up in the U UFC 172 card. You know, we saw in the conference call, he's already talking smack to John Jones. This guy is great at promoting himself and maybe he's doing it for a reason. Maybe he believes he'll win this fight and maybe he can go on to fight John Jones in the future. Yeah, I think this fight's got more layers than an onion. If you look at <laughs> if you look at uh, Anthony Rumble's previous opponents, so since losing to Vitor Belfort, he's fought guys like David Branch, uh, Steve Jones, uh, Jake Roshot, DJ Linderman, Andre Arlovsky, and Mike Kyle. Not exactly world beaters. So I think he's really going in the deep end at UFC 172 against Anthony Johnson. At the same time, Anthony Johnson, he's he's fought. You know, uh, I don't know about I don't know if I'd call him a murderer's row. But Leona Machida, I think that was a tough fight for him, and I very much disagree. I think he lost that fight. I completely, 100% believe that Machida won that fight. I think it was only one takedown that, you know, really secured Davis the, the victory. And against Vinny Magalhães, he didn't look that great. He really didn't want to get on the ground with him, and his striking didn't look great at all. Um, having said that, it did improve in the Machida fight. So I think it's it's a story of two guys that are very much untested. For Anthony Rumble Johnson, it's the story is he's coming back, but how will he how will he fare against you know better competition in the UFC? For Phil Davis, it's how will he handle an athlete like Anthony Rumble Johnson who can attack him in a lot of ways that the other guys couldn't. Obviously, Anthony Johnson has crazy knockout power. I hate to sound like Mike Goldberg here, but he's extremely explosive. He's a fantastic athlete, and the guy can wrestle. He doesn't have quite the wrestling chops that Phil Davis does, but he can, he can wrestle. And I think if he doesn't get wrestled, out-wrestled by Phil Davis, uh, it might be a tough tough fight for uh, Phil Davis. At the same time, Phil really improves every fight. And while he can mix, while he's not the you know an elite striker, he can mix it up. And he's got a lot of length, and if he can use that to keep uh, you know, Anthony Johnson at bay... Uh, I, I think, you know, he, he could do well in this fight. At the same time, we've seen a lot of guys who had their mind on other things, just like Phil Davis now has his mind on John Jones. And Anthony Rumble Johnson, he's not the type of guy that you want to, you know, be caught slipping on. So I think if Phil Davis has his head on, uh, you know, screwed on straight, I think he can he can edge out Anthony Rumble Johnson to a decision, um, possibly, possibly even submit him. I mean, Phil Davis is some very underrated grappling if not, he's going to get his head kicked off. That's that's my prediction. 
And, you know, that's an interesting point. You have the, you know, one of Anthony's losses is to Josh Koscheck at UFC 106 by Rear Naked Choke. The other one, of course, against Vitor Belfort by Rear Naked Choke as well. Um, and I, I think those are some great points. Now, that Anthony is in the light heavyweight division. What kind of Anthony will we see in the UFC? Obviously, he doesn't have to do those crazy cuts anymore. How much did that affect him going into his fights? I think those are just some of the questions we'll have to answer um, after watching UFC 172. But definitely... A very exciting fight and something that will really set things into perspective for us about Anthony Johnson and Phil Davis. So it's going to be, that's a great matchup right there by Joe Silva. Now going to the main event, the big one, John Jones and Glover Teixeira Cass. You know, we spoke about it at the start. Um, opinions are flying about this one. Anytime that John Jones fights, you know, a lot of people expect him to win. Do you expect John Jones to be Glover Teixeira in this one? In this fight, I do. I think uh, I think smart money will bet on John Jones just because he's faced this kind of adversity in the past. I'd say the main thing that separates Rampage and Glover is a. I'd say Glover's striking is better, and John Jones is. I think who was it? Uh, was it Winkle John or was it Hackham? I think Winkle John was saying that when he was on our show last week, he mentioned that Rampage's striking defense is better, and I think that's the thing. Glover does get caught. Um, having said that, I still think he has he has much more. He's a much bigger threat on the feet, and I think he's obviously got the grappling. I'm very curious to see if he can even take John Jones down, um, and and you know that that could really be the thing. Glover is a very complete guy. If he if he threatens with his strikes and goes to take John Jones down, we might see John Jones put on his back. I mean, we already saw it with Alexander Gustafsson. I think that shattered the aura a little bit of you know him being un un you know taken downable if if that's a word. At the same time, you know, John Jones, he's got that crazy reach. I think he's really, really zoned in for this fight. Um, and he looks he looks very calm and relaxed in, in this fight. The only other thing that could possibly, you know, uh, knock John Jones off is he's got a lot of pressure. And there's a lot of people calling him out from Alexander Gustafsson to Phil Davis to his cat running away. There's probably a lot of things weighing in on John Jones's mind. Having said that, I will still say John Jones is going to be uh, victorious come... Uh, come Saturday night or Sunday for us. At the same time, I'd love to see, you know, the King get dethroned and Glover get a knockout. What do you think, Dennis? Well, you know, no doubt about it. And, you know, his cat is weighing on his mind along with uh, someone stealing his phone and putting up some dodgy uh, updates onto Twitter. And, you know, we all know about that. It sh that surely detracts a little bit of t attention from it all. Um, you know, John Jones is a believer, like I mentioned before. You know, he's, he's strong in his faith and he's uh, a strong believer in his own skills. I think that carries him you know, past the chopping block. But let's just talk about Glover to share just for a moment before I give my prediction, which I might as well give now. You know, I think John Jones will beat Glover, you know, and I have to give him the benefit of the doubt after the great wins that he's had. But I think a lot of people are talking about Glover striking. What about his submissions? I mean, John Jones, great at putting submissions on. But how is his submission defense? I mean, he was almost caught in an arm bar by Vito Belfort, who is a great grappler himself. But I, I actually think Teixeira is a much better grappler than Vitor Belfort. I'm sure uh, John Jones made a fatal mistake. Sure, he's got long limbs and he got his arm caught in that awkward angle. But that's the thing about John Jones. He has long limbs. And while they're standing, that's great. When they're on the ground, it's dangerous. And when you have long limbs like John Jones and you're versing a guy like Glover Teixeira, who wins by, KO, uh, by KOs and by submissions, you have something to worry about. Now, um... I, I believe I believe you said that uh, Glover doesn't have as great a defense as Rampage. Obviously, that's what Mike Winkle John said during the interview. I agree. He does come out of the pit, and they're known to walk forward and get hit by punches. You know, you and me are always talking about this. Fighters from the pit, great at offense, not as great at defense. Um, so I'm hoping that Glover comes in with a great defensive game at this one, and um, I'm hoping that he's able to upset the world and win against John Jones, but my money is smart money, as you said, and smart money goes for John Jones. Yeah, I'd say the biggest uh, test here is how is Glover going to deal with the reach? That's what I'm curious about, because obviously they, they must have something cooking in that pot. They must have something, you know, as part mm. of the game plan on how they're going to get past the reach. I think obviously there's a big difference between training to get past the reach and actually being in the cage with John Jones and getting past that reach. Um I think once he gets in there, and he, even then, yeah, he's got scary knockout power, but John Jones, he's proven that he's he's got a good chin on him. He's taken 
not a lot, but he's taken a few flush shots, and he's, he's you know, he's, he took a few from Gustafsson, and Gustafsson's got knockout power. So we'll see how this one goes. One thing I will say about John Jones, a lot of his reflexes are very raw. So when he gets hit in the face, because he hasn't been hit that many times, his reactions are very raw. And if Glover can distract him enough, if Glover can get in there and throw a few, you know, pump out a few quick jabs and disguise a big right, you know, we, we could see John Jones, you know, going to sleep. And the crazy thing about Glover is, he's, if you look at his record, you see nothing but ones. A lot of his fights are finished in the first round. Um, he even TKO'd a guy at Impact FC2 in Sydney, Australia, which is crazy. Um, not because he knocked a guy out, but because he actually fought in Sydney. But and having said that, he's, he's supposedly got great conditioning. I'm, I'd be very curious to see it. I know, I know that they say that, you know, he's got great conditioning, but there's a lot of guys that think they have great conditioning until they get into a five rounder. So if it even lasts that long, we'll, we'll see who has the, the, uh, experience factor. Obviously, John Jones has had a lot of fights in the UFC for title fights and, you know, Glover's got, he, he's fought all, all, all over the world, but he hasn't had a single five rounder. So I think that could even be a deciding factor. Great, great point there, Cass. And now I'm going to put a question to you, and I'm interested to see what you'll say about this. Going back, who do you think is more of a threat? Now, I don't want you to think about the fight that happened between Gustafson and Jones. I want you to pretend like you never saw that fight. I want you to tell me, who do you think is more of a threat to John Jones going back before the Gustafson fight? If you had to look before then, and I said that John Jones is going to have two opponents. He's going to have Glover Teixeira, or Alexander Gustafsson, who would you say is more dangerous? If I never saw the Gustafsson fight, I would say Glover for sure. Okay. Well, you know, I think that's sort of my point as well. I mean, Glover didn't have a very impressive fight against Ryan Bader. Gustafsson did. Um, so I think a lot of people have changed their minds. I was very similar, similar like you. I believe that Glover had a better shot than Gustafsson. So I think... I think my point with this one is that no no one knows what's going to happen in these fights, and I think that's why it's so exciting. You know, is it likely that Jones will win this fight? Yes. Is it likely that he uses reach and outbox Glover, frustrate him, possibly even get a takedown, somehow finish him? Absolutely. But is there a tiny little possibility, and I'm talking about a spec here, that we see a Glover Teixeira overturn everybody's expectations and pull an Alexander Gustafson and have an exciting five-round fight, you know, that goes into the history books? You know, there's a chance there as well. So I don't know about other MMA fans, but for me, this is going to be one of the more exciting cards in the last few months. Absolutely. Yeah, I, th I think there's more than a smidgen of a chance. I think um, I think there's there's definitely a chance. All these questions will be answered this Saturday. All I know is I'm extremely excited. This is definitely a big test for Glover. And I think it's more a test for Glover than it is for John Jones. John Jones is already established. We already know what he's capable of. This is Glover really stepping up to the big leagues. This is a test for Glover. Can he fix all those past mistakes? Is he Has he improved his defense enough to not get tagged like he did against Ryan Bader and Fabio Maldonado? Can he use his grappling? Can he take down John Jones? And can he avoid, you know, getting getting guillotined in those takedowns? So this is this is going to be a crazy pay per view, and I'm super pumped. And uh, if you haven't ordered already, I recommend you do so because I know Dennis and me are going to be at my house with the with a whole crowd of people with barbecue ribs in our mouths, and it's it's going to be a party. That's right, guys. And now don't forget UFC 172. We will be tweeting it live, so you make sure that you add us and or follow us on at Submission Radio. I mean, at Submission Oz, A-U-S, and make sure you check out some of our thoughts and opinions on the fights as they happen. Also, let us know what you think in the comment section below or interact, or interact with us through Twitter. We love hearing feedback on our show and also your thoughts on the upcoming fights. Yeah, exactly. With with this show that we do, obviously, it's a little bit one way in the sense that we can't hear what you're saying, but we love to hear what, what, what everybody says. So definitely jump on our Twitter. Tell us what you think. Uh, comment on the in the comment section if, you, if you're viewing this on YouTube. Tell us who you think is going to come out uh the winner and even tell us what you thought about the travis brown and verdoom fight but um yeah i believe next show we're going to do is going to be on monday we're going to have some uh, some sexy sexy guests uh i think the next couple of weeks we're, we're going to be action-packed with guests so it should be great we'll, we'll let you know who the guests are as soon as we have them locked in and confirmed and uh yeah that will then you can definitely uh, let us know what questions you want asked that's right guys stitcher itunes tune in youtube we're all over that some bitch Go on there, check out the latest episode. If you can't listen to it on YouTube, make sure you hop on to Stitcher and check out the rest of the episode. And uh, follow us on Twitter to find out 
information about upcoming guests, what's going on, and all the latest news coming from Submission Radio. Yeah, and of course, a big thank you for TJ Dillashaw to coming on the show and uh, doing the interview with us. Follow him at TJ Dillashaw on Twitter. Other than that, guys, have a great weekend. Enjoy the fights. Uh, I'm sure you will, and we'll see you next week. See you next, see you next week, guys.